for one fantastical ride because, like my favorite Pokemon, I choose you! My Little Pony is an animated show from the 1980s which has seen its fair share of reboots, movies, merchandise, and reimaginings. The most popular version of it today, at least as far as I can tell, is the newer Friendship is Magic show. The premise is pretty similar to the original. A bunch of Magical Pony characters always have to save the day from something or someone and learn about some type of positive social notion on the way. This iteration, though, is much snappier and it has a modern animation style. It's earned it number one place in the hearts of many adults today, too. Like, to the point where there's such a phenomenon as, quote, bronies, men buying their favorite ponies branded merchandise, and much, much more. I have known about the general idea of Topless for years now, but never did I think that any grown-up was combining the idea of Topas and colorful children's cartoon characters. This episode actually is inspired directly by that discovery. Here's what I've conjured up for you. What precisely is a tulpa? At the most basic level, a tulpa is a thought form being that is created from intense concentration. Originally, the idea is said to be from the highest levels of Tibetan spiritual magic, that's magic with a K, meaning that it was ritual-centered, ceremonial magic. It apparently was also almost exclusively reserved for high-level group magic, as it is regarded, or at least it was, as one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, type of magic to complete effectively and appropriately as instructed by the masters of the religion. Additionally, the serious Tibetan Buddhism masters and pupils of the ages gone by had many commandments about how, when, why, where to work with non-corporeal beings and tulpas, and which types of tulpas to create, and when, why, how. Their version of tulpamancy was a sacred art, practiced almost exclusively in holy service of the community. Outside of the traditional Tibetan religion and practices, there exists a number of separate classes of thought beings in the wider occult and mysticism community. Golems are said to be thought forms that are typically programmed with one command. They are brought to life in order to fulfill one mission or command only. Another serious tulpa type is the servitor. From what I understand, these types of thought forms are made by using sigils. These, unlike golems, can be programmed for multiple commands, and sometimes can be said to gain sentience. They apparently still lack free will, however, even with sentience. There are also the Egregor and others. These days, as with many other concepts, the layman's notion of the tulpa has changed with the times, people, culture, and language. Whereas it used to be a strict religious term steeped in mystery, Today, it is often used more casually on the internet and amongst the youth to talk about an accidentally created imaginary friend, in some cases, 
or what are called headmates in other circles, or the detailed thought form of a desired waifu My Little Pony character on Reddit. I'm thinking, though, that it could be used just as accurately to describe much, much more. I happen to be of the persuasion that the body and brain are template vessels, like radio receivers, each with a specific range of frequencies, or in biological terms, each with genetic strengths, weaknesses, and traits to that particular vessel. It seems to me that the body and brain, then, are influenced at least to some degree, by the soul who is in possession of the receiver and therefore its timelines at any given moment. Perhaps in reflection of this, recently, the common culture has begun to shift and the newer generation of tulpamancers, headmate havers, and drifty daydreamers have come up with a new alternative vocabulary for specificity in tulpa type. We've got paragenic, which apparently arises from or is caused by or influenced by MADD, which is maladaptive daydreaming. More on that later. Periogenic, a headmate system made up of walk-ins, more on that later as well. Protogenic, a system in one body that has existed since birth or for as long as they can remember. And perogenic refers to a system or headmates that were created using thought-based or metaphysical means, usually deliberately, meaning internally contained, more classic, tulpas. As for the more formal, spiritual, and or psychological side of modern-day tulpa and tulpa-esque conditions, practices, beliefs, and disorders, based on my experiences, studies, and current understanding, I've made us an iceberg-style graphic to dive more fully into the layers of them all. Here's where it gets pretty heavy. There are a lot of shorthand substitutes for DSM disorder names, and if you're not aware of them all, I do encourage you to look them up on your own. To explain each diagnosis would turn this video easily into a two-hour run. Character longing is the first layer. This is when a person so loves the idea, appearance, or any other aspect of a fictional character that they form the idea of the character solidly enough in their mind that it seems to become a real person to the dreamer, but the dreamer knows that the character or person in their mind and any fantasies, scenarios, etc. are all fictional and that they are in control of every detail. Moving on, we have my biological rotational acquisition theory. And this is somewhat related to some of the symptoms of dissociative identity disorder, if you know much of that. There was a psych pro that I came across several years ago. She was talking about, quote, DID, also being possibly a genetic quantum brain setting or ability, a body and brain with more flexible and permeable boundaries around which spirit and soul hold them, and that these people are being mislabeled as DID because no other understanding or term exists for it professionally yet. I cannot for the life of me find her name or remember who she is, 
So if you do know who she is, please do share and I will put the information right here. Essentially, because of her own work and research on this, she said that she believes that there is a portion of the population who have a main personality or ego, like most human beings, who have not had or seemingly had severe trauma in childhood, but that they are prone to possession, and not demonic possession, where the victim is spewing vomit and the head is spinning, a la Reagan in the original Exorcist movie. No, she said that she believes that there is a group of spirits or souls that share the body from the non-corporeal quantum side of life and who come here to experience and or achieve certain goals. I agree with her. I call the action of organic switching between body holders, rotational acquisition, and the full genetic condition of it, biological rotational acquisition theory, which I consider a rare form of inherited external quantum possession wherein the main current incarnate human personality has no memory of any possession or switching, but experiences missing time, among other high strangeness, and the person does not have any other symptoms, otherwise is diagnosed with or suspected of having or having features of DID, NPD, ASPD, BPD, CPTSD, PTSD, MADD, schizophrenia, schizoaffective or related features or disorders, depression, bipolar of any kind, ADD, ADHD, a history or current drug use or dependence or any of such for alcoholism, mania, trauma, and or moderate to severe anxiety disorders, OCD, and no immediate family history of them. From my time in providing care in a multitude of ways, pun intended, and my years of professional clinical studies on site at a severe trauma recovery clinic, I've come to note that females, when compared to male peers, are much more likely to develop DID, MADD, BPD, and have a far higher likelihood of being born to a body that operates on the basis of rotational acquisition as its genetic default. I also believe that certain children were bred in the old cultures, so Phoenician, Mayan, Egyptian, because this was understood and exploited in order to provide appropriate vessels for the gods to inhabit within the physical world. This is still going on today with the Dalai Lama reincarnation beliefs and practices. It's just pitched differently to the public. In handling the few cases of BRAT that I have over the years, I've found that these people benefit greatly from learning and practicing daily grounding techniques and setting up mindfulness as a way of life in every moment, abstaining from even occasional alcohol, tobacco use, or drugs, especially drugs that have psychoactive effects and setting intentional energetic boundaries by claiming the body as one's own, and therefore the life as one's own, regularly and with passion. The other souls in every case I've seen of BRAT, few as they are, have respectfully vacated. And this is if the person wants to be fully here all the time. Some do not because they are sharing their body and brain with highly responsible, beneficial other souls and gain a great deal by allowing shared access. I don't judge either way. 
in these cases, the system is a positive, well-oiled, respectful, healthy machine with no mental illness, drug or alcohol use or addiction, abuse or neglect, where everyone is working on a shared schedule and all are benefiting from the efforts, lives, contributions, and talents of everyone else who shares the vessel. Who am I to object? MADD, or maladaptive daydreaming, is next. This is a mental condition which is classified as a response to stress and or trauma in one's life, and the main symptom is that of an extremely detailed inner world in which the person spends enough time that the rest of their life, responsibilities, and relationships are largely directly and negatively affected. People with this condition tend to have overlapping symptoms with CPTSD, PTSD, BPD, DID, and other symptoms and diagnoses that are usually based on extreme trauma, though some of these factors may indeed be genetic in nature instead. Some with MADD cannot stop themselves from indulging in the daydreaming. I believe it is important to note that although MADD is typically part of many severe trauma and stress responses, MADD can and sometimes does seem to have other causes at times, and I support the notion in the mental health care community lately that it should have its own classification outside of its role and connection with larger trauma response conditions. Next, we have the walk-ins. The idea behind a walk-in is generally that a lifetime was too difficult for the original soul, and the new soul replaced the old soul in a contractual surrender. Or that someone had a near-death experience and, for whatever reason, came back different, aka, as a whole new person because the original soul vacated and another took full control and responsibility for the life and the body. People sometimes report that their friend, family member, or whomever came back as a totally different personality after a near-death experience. Is it indeed because they are a different person, a different soul, or is it only because of biological changes, such as brain chemistry, brain activity? Or, as I contend, is it both at the same time? Dissociative identity disorder used to be called MPD, or multiple personality disorder. This is typically classed as an extreme trauma response to unbearable childhood abuse, neglect, or chaos. It is also said to be a result of ritual abuse, such as with government programs like MKUltra. The typical media portrayal of DID is in movies such as American Ultra, where there are certain planned trigger words, phrases, images, places, or noises that cause the person with DID to switch dramatically to a desired alternate personality or alter. But I suspect that this type of DID is rather rare, as the planning and planting that would need to go into this class of developed, purposeful person with DID, aka system, would be immense and immaculate. A much better, more accurate media depiction of DID would be in the recent show, Moon Knight. It may also somewhat get into BRAT territory. For reference, Fritz Springmeier wrote a handbook on this, and there is even an old Egyptian manuscript on the creation of such a slave as well. In most of real life, in the wild, as the kids say today, 
trauma-based DID is nearly undetectable and unplanned. The switches between alters are subtle, and the differences between the alters to anyone on the outside are almost entirely unnoticed. After all, it is a trauma response whose sole purpose is to help the person survive complete chaos. The current neurological and psychological theories, as I'm understanding them, are that the brain has responded to harsh childhood abuse and neglect by walling off portions of the developing full personality, its memories, trauma, likes, dislikes, and even physical responses and interpretations of allergies and other stimuli. Some studies have shown that one alter may be allergic to, say, peanuts, and may be going into a deadly allergic reaction, but switching to another alter clears up the reaction within minutes. Different alters also have different brainwave patterns and states of being, apparently. I do suspect that disembodied gods, goddesses, and other types of non-corporeal souls can also hop into someone with DID for a spin, since DID is, after all, the complete erosion and lack of all boundaries internally, and boundary deficiency is a main cause of many lifetime-determining experiences, I believe. This next level on the iceberg is the idea that God and gods are tulpas. That human beings were so lonely and afraid of death that they imagined benevolent creator beings. I think that that is enough said on this. Schizophrenia begins our deepest descent. The general understanding of schizophrenia is that it differs from DID and MADD, etc., by being a complete separation from this reality, complete with voices being physically heard by the person, delusions and other severe hallucinations, plus an inability to function in life without medication due to the accompanying mania, depression, and disruption to nutritional and bodily needs, sleep, etc. being met, and the fact that the fulfillment of responsibilities and relationships are all being completely obliterated. Recent research shows that it is genetic and brain-based, with a telltale sign being that the eyes track, focus, and function very differently than someone who does not have schizophrenia. Until better neurological therapies or complete cures are made or discovered, schizophrenia and its sibling disorders require a treatment plan of permanent, careful, professionally supervised lifestyle management combined with psychoactive prescription drugs designed specifically for the management of schizophrenia and its symptoms. Negative possession is our second to last stop. Negative possession is essentially the opposite of biological rotational acquisition. In negative possession, a person is being tormented from an external source by beings that people today would call demons, hostile aliens, or spiritual, emotional, or energetic parasites. These may be present with the person since birth, as they may be haunting a particular family line, or they may develop an attachment that turns into a split-style possession over time where the original personality is present and aware while the negative entity tortures the body, the original personality, and others in the area. This is more of the classical demonic oppression and possession idea. Interestingly enough, there is a man named Jerry Marzinski, 
who insists that schizophrenics aren't insane, but are really being tormented by non-human intelligences and entities. I concur. Somewhat. I believe that there are genetically schizophrenic people and that there are people out there who are diagnosed as schizophrenic but who are indeed suffering from severe susceptibility to entity interference because of poor or no auric lifestyle, health, and or vibrational boundaries putting them on the same wavelength and within easy grasp of the parasite or parasites. Jerry still does in-depth interviews on the subject, and I would highly recommend hearing him out. For people with this torment, I have found that a complete gutting of their lives is the only solution where everything is torn down and built entirely from scratch. The bottom tip of our iceberg belongs to the Sophie's World theory. As I have said many times before, this book haunts me and, according to the internet, haunts many, many others to this day. It also has inspired this deepest part of the iceberg. What if none of us are real? What if we are all Tulpas, fictional characters in someone else's book? and some of us have been programmed or written to, at some point, gain sentience about this reality. But is that truly sentience then? What if ignorance really is bliss? This is where I defend and rather admire the human experience. The typical human lifetime experience mandates that one body has one soul and one personality or ego, and that's what human being is, who it is. They each live one lifetime, predictable, stable, full of emotion because they're caught up in the story that they tell themselves. Their brains and their bodies filter out almost everything except their one physical reality. I believe that outside of the healthy, whole, intact, incarnate human ego experience, the ego style for other types of peoples is more like a kaleidoscope or a cracked mirror, with the whole containing many near fractal mini egos and that though they are extremely magically talented, wise, and require much less for their survival, I think that they may be bored and or need human beings to stay entertained, engaged, mentally healthy, and or maybe other factors too. And that this is why we have seemingly one god, goddess, race, or phenomenon taking on many faces, names, and appearances in order to interact with humankind over the ages, including what religious people call angels. Biblically accurate angels are rarely acknowledged, it seems. And nonetheless, I do believe that they should be, for many reasons. If it's been a while since you've enjoyed yourself a sleepless night spent in acute fear, I suggest looking up encounters with illustrations and descriptions of biblically accurate angels. It may become readily apparent why they were said to approach human people with the now famous motto, do not be afraid. 
what if my little pony and biblical angels are just an example of two opposite sides of the same coin? What if they are both originally just soothing concepts that human beings made up and then eventually became culturally real? and then, at last, transcended those limits because enough energy was put into them. And what if we are the same as them, brought to life, whatever that may be, in the very same manner? What makes someone or something real? What makes someone or something alive sentient what makes someone or something real what makes a person who they are is it brain chemistry soul spirit memories preferences all of that some of it none of it something completely different? What if egolessness, or nearly so, and creativity are at the heart of some non-human peoples and ultimately of God? If you were this way, wouldn't you want to take a break and immerse yourself in a solid story experience too sometimes? If you have ever played Super Smash Bros. Melee, you might remember the game ending. It's highly relevant to my point here. My suggestion is to have fun. Live a life of your choosing as much as possible. Why not have fun, treat this life as you please, and go with the flow. Between the three of us on the battlefield today, who won? Sudden death!